This is Friday, December 21st, 2018. We are at the Bedford VA Medical Center, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and we are privileged to have with us today Stephen Duggan, who is going to talk about his father, Mario Aiello. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much for having me today. Okay. And may I ask when your father was born? My father was born May 6, 1922. And where was he born? He was born in a small little town on the outskirt of Boston. It's called Reedville, Massachusetts. Uh, and he was born in a small home, actually, not in a hospital, at 7 Waterloo Street in Reedville. And what was his marital, excuse me, what was his marital status? When he came home from the war, he did get married to a woman named Dorothy, and he had three lovely children, Patricia, Jean, and John. And that marriage lasted for many decades. And then after it was dissolved, there was a point that he met my mother, and he was with my mother for approximately 50 years. And are there any grandchildren? Sad to say right now, no. <laughs> and tell us about uh, your father's life growing up in Reedville. So Reedville, he was a very proud Reedville boy. His common phrase was born and bred in Reedville. Um, great pride in being an Italian, great pride in being in a community that was made up of Germans and Polish and Irish. Uh, loved his family. He loved his mother, especially Alfonsina. Um, this is a little picture of him about age nine with his mother in a parking lot near their home in Reedville, Mass. Um, very proud of his father, Bruno, who was a, a railroad tie worker. He would install the railroad ties throughout Dedham and, and Hyde Park, some of the uh, rails that we ride on nowadays. Um, he loved hunting. He loved trapping, even as a young boy, and did much of this through his grammar school and high school days. And he actually became a bit of a marksman over time, which helped support the role that he would eventually play when he went into the military. Now you mentioned your father going to school. Uh, where did he go to school? He went to a, uh, his grammar school was called the Kavanaugh School, um, which was a, uh, it was a standard, it's actually still existence, uh, in an existence in Hyde Park, the Kavanaugh School. After that, he moved on to Hyde Park High. And he graduated from Hyde Park High and moved on uh, into working in a machine shop after that. Uh, locally in Hyde Park, learned to, to work several different machines, the lathe and other equipment, and then he was reaching the point of uh, inscription, so there was no further schooling or work at that time. Did your father uh, recall anything about while he was in school, uh, was he made aware of events happening across the ocean, say in Europe or in Asia during that time? I think he mentioned just very briefly in passing. It was, it was general knowledge, but there was, um, like many of the kids nowadays as well, there was very little emotion attached to it. It was just information that the war was going on overseas and efforts were going to be needed. And I think he knew there were hints when he was in high school, coming close to graduation, that inscription would be coming. So what did your father think about Benito Mussolini? What did he think about him? I, I can't honestly say he shared that with me in any real time. Um, he was a big advocate of reading. Uh, when he came home from the war, I noticed quite often, again, as where I was a child, he's constantly reading, a voracious reader when it came to World War II, to um, bibliographies and uh, World War II accounts. He really enjoyed that. So I'm sure he had a position. He didn't share it with me. And do you, uh, did your father ever talk about the day the United States was attacked at Pearl Harbor? Not specifically, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, how many siblings did your father have? He had three sisters mm -hmm. and he had three brothers. And my understanding is all three brothers along with him entered the military. That's correct. It was himself as the oldest, Mario. Mm -hmm. His brother underneath him was Joseph. The brother under him was Salvatore. And the, and the youngest brother was Charlie. And did all four make it out? Okay. They all made it home. And were they all in the Army? 
Uh, I believe that Joe was in the Air Force Reserve, okay. but the other brothers were in the Army. All right, let's now talk about your father's service in the Army. Was he, did he enlist or was he drafted? He was indeed drafted. And when was that? The, let me reference that if we could just do Very that for good. a quick second. Mm -hmm. So on his uh, discharge summary here, he is, he was inducted into the service of the United States December 11th, 1942. And that was done in Boston, Massachusetts. And he began his active duty as a private in the Army on December 18, 1942. And where was he sent for basic training? He re I recall he said Oklahoma. I think it was in Oklahoma. That was quite some, some distance for a boy of Reedville. And yeah, travel, that would be. To travel in that direction first <laughs> it was kind of odd. And did, he, did your father have any um, recollections of basic training? I think he mentioned to me once about the food. Um, growing up as an Ita uh, Italian boy in an Italian community with Italian household, uh, that type of food, it was typically a little bit more flavor and spice, as he would say it. Um, so I think the, the <laughs> military food was a little bit bland for him. So he said that was probably the hardest part of basic training for him. He was used to being outside. He was used to hiking for many, many miles with his own uh, hunting and trapping equipment as a, as a high school student, as he would do that in the daytime before going to school and as well as after school. So he was used to being very disciplined. So the physical aspects of it, he was fine with. It was the food I think he suffered through. <laughs> did he receive any advanced training? He did. He received training to, to put him into a position, what's called a, a Tech 5A a position. I, I guess it's equivalent to what, what someone would say a corporal. So he was trained for uh, the observation post for, for long-range um, military fire. So he was in charge of large equipment for firing on the enemy at a distance. And this came back to part of his marksmanship, his discipline. And he would often say he was unfortunately very good at this role uh, he came to share with me in his later years. And what happened after he received his training in Oklahoma? <clears throat> well, he was shipped off to, um, I believe it was, he had two, um, two main locations. It was northern Africa and then eventually making it to Italy. Um, he served for over two years overseas um, in that role as a Tech 5 uh, for oper observational posts. Um, he experienced a lot of direct fire upon him and the troops around him. His, his fellow soldiers, um, and he also had to deal out a lot of uh, blows to the enemy, which he felt very mixed about, and, and it was very painful in his heart for many years, but that was his primary role in, in both Northern Africa and in Italy. Okay. Did your father have any specific memory, say, about Northern Africa? I'm try I think most of the focus that he shared with me um, it was very much the same, I think, both in Northern Africa and Italy. Actually, he did comment about um, Northern Africa. He mentioned that many of the, his, his fellow soldiers on the long hikes, that they would be suffering from the heat. My father was not a person who liked to drink water for some reason. We think he may be actually a camel. He was probably a part camel. <laughs> he would often give up his canteen to fellow soldiers. He could do um, the hiking for many, many miles under extreme heat and not have the craving um, of water. So he used to, um, that was one of the things he remembered, the, 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 the searing heat, um, and he was not a fan of it, but he was able to, he felt good when he was able to give water to his, his fellow soldiers. And does, do you, does he, uh, did he say how long he was in North Africa? I think at North Africa was anywhere between, I think, 10 and 11 months, mm -hmm. approximately. <clears throat> and then it was off to Naples, Italy. And there's also a, a mention here where I think they said we have, um, he, he's, let's see here. He served in Naples and also in Rome. That's where he was located. And that's where he actually saw more of the actual battles and was involved with more near-death experiences himself. And that's where he, sh he actually shared many of the memories with us as family members. Mm -hmm. He did this in his, his later years, 
Um, it was something that he just shared um, during just general conversation. We would sit and it would somehow trail off to military issues and he would share some stories. And what were some of the stories, if you're able to share those with us? I would feel privileged to do so. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that comes closest to me is the, uh, I call it the one inch story. Um, my father was under fire with uh, one soldier, one of his good friends that he had become friendly with over time. Um, and my father did not often wear his helmet and his friend had his helmet on beside him and they were found, they were down on the ground. I don't not necessarily know if it was a foxhole, but they wound up being under fire and a bullet crossed the bridge of my father's nose and cut into the, just the tip of his nose and burned through the tip of his nose. And unfortunately, his good friend beside him received the bullet in the temple and had lost his life right at that moment. And my father had to just stay pinned down next to him until they were secured by supporting fire. Um, that haunted him a lot and he kept realizing, he would always, he sort of make a joke on it saying if my nose was even bigger, he says, I'm lucky I'm an Italian with a big nose. Lucky it wasn't that big because maybe something could have been worse. And, but I know it, sh it, sh it shook him because he realized it, it was just a fraction of an inch and it could have been him that didn't come home and I wouldn't be here and all the people that he helped wouldn't have been helped. So. I find that to be the most amazing story mm -hmm. from him. There was another instance where um, he was with a captain on an observation post that had gone bad and the troops had already moved on and he was for some reason caught down there with, he was stuck with the captain and he was on this observation post for three days and unfortunately there were a lot of um, fallen soldiers around them on this observation post and they were trapped and couldn't get out. And this, he found this to be the most painful thing. And after being there for three days, some of the soldiers would, would experience rigor mortis and they would begin to sit up during the evening hours. They, their bodies would start to move. And the captain that he was with was essentially frightened and climbed into his pup tent and wouldn't come out during this period. And my father would have to go around to colleagues and to fo soldiers of, of the German side and he just pierced their belly to release the air so that they would rest, so that they would lay at rest. And that he, that was to him, that haunted him still all the way into his 90s. He could still recall that. And he did it as a merciful thing. Um, there was no, it didn't matter if it was a German soldier, it didn't matter an American soldier, these were the fallen and he went to just simply put them at rest. That um, is something that stood out for him. There was one other story I just wanted to share is there was a period near the end of the war where things were coming close to the end and they, he was aware that uh, things were winding down. They were getting that sense and uh, he was on observation and he, he could see at, at a somewhat of a close distance, he saw a, a young, a very young German soldier, almost like a boy, but wearing a German uniform looking more frightened than anything else, kind of running along a, uh, a, an embattled field. There was, he was basically all alone and, and, and structures around the, the boy just, um, and I do say a boy, um, and his orders is to shoot and kill and he remembers just staring at that boy through his, 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 from his rifle and he couldn't pull the trigger. It was after much death, he had seen much death and he had inflicted much death upon the enemy and he saw this boy and he couldn't do it anymore. He had to, he just couldn't do it. And I think at that point was where he started to, it was right at the end for him and after that he had come home. But I think that story played over him many times and he had realized that he was just born on the side of America and he felt this sadness for this child running around playing as if he's a soldier on the, in the other army. So it was a very painful experience for him. Mm -hmm. And you know he made a very hard decision because he didn't know if that boy would then go on and pick up a gun against his enemy, against one of his fellow soldiers. Those are incredible stories. We thank you for sharing those with us. Thank you for letting me say them. And let's uh, show them this now. So when he, one of the things we're so proud of, my father received the Bronze Star from a meritorious um, achievement in uh, protecting his fellow soldiers. It says here, PFC Mario Fiello of 7 Waterloo, Reedville, 
Street in, in, in uh, uh, Massachusetts, won the Bronze Star for meritorious service with the Fifth Army in Italy and is shown here as Brigadier General Henry D.J. II pins the prize upon the chest of a hero. Aiello's heroism was recorded on May 18, 1944. So this to me, we, we set this up for my mother um, and my mother looks at this photo every day and we're very proud of this and even when I did my father's eulogy, I, I focused on the aspect that my father was acknowledged a hero and I was, I never felt so proud of my father as I did at his eulogy, the time of his eulogy. I didn't, and I think a lot of times we take our parents for granted and the challenges and the journeys they have. And I was so grateful to, when I had the eulogy, had the chance to do the eulogy, to go through all these process of looking through his history and realizing my father's heroism saved people that came home, met spouses, had children, had businesses, and their legacy went on because of something that he did. Mm -hmm. And I've just gotten this, this well, swell of pride in my chest even when I talk about my father. Now, did your father serve with the fifth throughout his army career? Well, he actually was, it's interesting because I'm, I was looking at this and it, it says here on his, the military division, um, it states that he was actually part of the 75th Field Artillery uh, Battalion. So that was part of where he was as well. And where was he when the war in Europe ended? Was he still in Italy? He was in Italy. He actually talked a little bit once in a while about where the fighting had kind of subdued. And he, he referenced this a lot, some woman by the name of Mary, I think. Um, and we're not sure if it's fully, the story is, is fully true or it's just a, a positive, just a positive fantasy. But he remembers a woman with a child um, who had apparently lost his, her, her spouse and she was now destitute with this child and I think he tried to do what he could with resources to help her at near the end of the war where, where he was the battle had slowed down so there was more downtime mm -hmm. to help civilians that had been um, caught mm -hmm. up in, in the battles. You mentioned earlier that your father was in Rome. Yes. Uh, did he have any uh, recollections of being in the Eternal City? You know I, it's funny that I, I would think that would be a great memory to share Unfortunately, he never gave anything where he had said he had gone through any of the specific, you know, been to the Colosseum or anything mm -hmm. like that. There was no mention of that, and I wish there was. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the things that haunted him mainly were the, were the sad memories. Right. So your father, uh, your father was in Italy. It's VE Day. Did, did he have any recollections about celebrating VE Day? I think just joy. I mm -hmm. think he was just joyful, um, elated. I think he had a sense that it was coming. Um, and my father's n not always a very emotionally expressive person, good or bad, um, but I think he was just genuinely happy and, and overwhelmed with, with you know, I'm, it's over. This chaos is over. Now, did your father uh, think that he was going to fight in Japan, or was he, did he know that he was going to be discharged almost at any time? I think that was the sense. He knew he wasn't going to Japan. I didn't mm -hmm. think he had any fear of being sent there. Alrighty, so when and where, but first of all, uh, when did he come back to the United States? Well, let's see again. <laughs> let's oh, do another quick reference here. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was discharged on December 18th, 1942. Um, and let's see, the term, he was, his service was actually terminated September 22nd, 1945 at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Okay, so he was discharged at Fort Devens. Mm -hmm. And what was his rank when he left? He left as officially a Tech 5 mm -hmm. battery, um, battery A, um, uh, excuse me, a, a battery A Tech 5, which mm -hmm. is equivalent to a corporal. All righty. Yes. So he's at Fort Devens, he's a hop, skip, and a jump back to Reedville. You've got that. Mm -hmm. And he heads home um, to start up some of the old relationships. Um, my father was a very um, strong, emotional man. Um, he loved his family, but he very rarely would he show signs of weakness. He was one of those people that would love to help. He was very boisterous, would love to um, be loud and, and joyful with people but very rare would he show sadness openly to people. But when he returned to Reedville, it was back to family, looking for work, mm -hmm. looking to take up with his, his old romances and, and hopefully start a family. 
Now, did your father join any service organizations such as the Legion or the VFW? I, you know, it's interesting when I when I saw those when I thought of those questions. Of all things, my father did not join those. I was surprised, actually, he did not participate in any of those things after the war. I don't know if that's because he was just proud of the service that it, it happened, but I don't think he wanted to continue reliving it over and over. And I think he may have been fearful that if he was around people that had served, it would have just been a continual discussion. And most of the men that he had known as friends, uh, as, as that he grew up with that served, that did return, He'd see them anyways, and I'm sure they had constant conversations, but not in a formal sense of being part of an organization. And did your father ever attend reunions? He did not. He did not. So what did your father do after the war? After the war, my father got married to a woman named Dorothy, and he had three children, Patricia, Jean, and John. He started up uh, with a small bakery in the town of Reedville where he had uh, grown up. He started that with his brother Charlie and they ran this bakery for a couple of years, basically a little Italian bakery. And after a couple of years he was essentially bored of it <laughs> and he wanted to do something else. He had been a mechanic before so he had, he had started a mechanic shop. After that he decided he wanted to finally move into something bigger and more independent for himself. So he started a construction company which, which he had spent the, the bulk of his life doing. And he did that for over three decades. It was very successful, built a lot of commercial properties in and around Boston um, and uh, a lot of homes as well. And he got great joy out of, uh, and I remember this even as a child uh, when I was born, he was, he'd done his last job in Hyde Park, Massachusetts. He had built a church and he had great joy in working alongside his men, men who were much younger. He would be out there in the field working with them. He'd be on the roofs. He would be in in doing the hands-on work and he felt it was best to serve them by being there alongside of them doing that work and he enjoyed giving young men opportunities who didn't have uh, the, the chance to find work elsewhere he, he got great pride out of doing that and that's another thing I'm proud of now did any of your uh, siblings uh, join the military to my knowledge no Patricia, Jean, and John, they, they were not part of the military. All right. And how important did your father believe was it to serve in the military? I think for my father, even though he was inscripted, believed in his heart, and all, through all the actions that he'd shared through the years, that it was a critical thing that a young men and women had to do this. Um, he was a proud American. He was. He, he, he really believed in what they were doing, that this was, a, uh, this, was a, this was a just cause, this war, and that young men and women needed to stand up. And he, he was not afraid to talk about that. And just kind of going off topic for a moment, I know your father had his construction company during a very interesting period mm -hmm. in Boston's history. Yeah. It sounds like he helped <clears throat> build up the next generation of Boston buildings. He did a lot of the actual apartments throughout the, the where you see apartment complexes. He did a lot of apartment complexes. He also did some work down the Cape, but the main buildings that he built around the outskirts of Boston and the suburbs were apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. That still stand today. I yeah. thought he's proud of. <laughs> and now let's show now tell me a little bit about this photo. This photo is a photo of my father at age ninety four. It is his ninety fourth birthday. He's at, he's currently, in this photo, he is at our home. We had built an extension onto our home when he was about in his um, early 80s. And we brought him and my mother to our home. And he had just received his haircut and he was getting ready for a birthday dinner. And he was very joyful. And this photo means a lot to us now because it brings great uh, solace to my mother. Um, it sits above her couch and every day she gets up, she sees this and uh, we feel he's still with us when we mm -hmm. see this. We see his smile. Mm -hmm. And when did he pass? He passed this year, mm -hmm. the, um, September 27th, 2018, mm -hmm. here at the Bedford VA. Okay. And aside from the, um, we'll talk about the Bedford VA in a moment, but did he take advantage of any other veterans benefits programs? Unfortunately, no. He was, he was very much, uh, he had, like I said, he had been working all of his life. He 
I think he compartmentalized a lot of his suffering over the years. Um, he didn't look for any services to provide for, he wasn't looking for services for himself. Um, eventually when he developed some medical um, issues in his later years, he did depend on the VA quite a bit. And the VA was amazing at what they had done, uh, the support services they provided, both himself and, and us as, a, as caregivers for him. Um, but he didn't take advantage of any additional services. And he did pass away here at the Bedford VA. Yes. Um, and I, my understanding was that he did suffer from dementia. He did. He came here to the Bedford VA in November of 2017 mm -hmm. after um, he was diagnosed with dementia several years earlier. And it was a slow process. Um, and we got to the point where he was he was in danger of him for himself and for my mother. He just, reality had stripped away and he no longer saw things the way they were. And the people that came into the home to care for him, which we did have people coming in, they were no longer able to, to provide the care because he saw everyone as an enemy. There was a lot of hallucinations and issues going on. So the VA did a wonderful assessment in West Roxbury, Massachusetts, and they connected with the Bedford VA here, and we got him into the geriatric psychiatric unit and they worked diligently with him for, I think, five, five, six months where they worked very hard to try to get the right antipsychotic medication into him. And they, they had success. They, it took a long time, but I was so amazed at the staff, the doctors, the nurses, the care that they give. Um, after about that, after about five or six months, they said, you know, we really need to try to, we've stabilized him. We've got him in a place of normalcy. Um, we need to move him into a nursing home. That process went on and, and then we were actually blessed with the fact that they were able to qualify him for hospice. And he was able to stay here at the Bedford VA in Building 2 in hospice where he served out his final five months with us. Mm -hmm. And they, they, just as the geriatric psychiatric unit, um, the, the staff in Building 2 were amazing. Mm -hmm. um, they were loving, they were caring, they kept his dignity alive to the very end, and we were very grateful. Mm -hmm. Stephen, for those who are going to be seeing this interview and may have questions regarding, say, caring for an aging parent, especially those who are veterans, what's the message you'd like to convey? That's a, that's a big question, <clears throat> and it's an important question. My wife and I built an addition onto our home about 12 years ago. When we took on my parents, um, they were in much better health when we first did so. They had still their mobility, they had their mental capacity, they had more independence still. You have to find time as a caregiver to care for yourself. And that may, be, it may seem trite and you may say, well, of course, that's a given. It's very hard sometimes to carve out that time in between your normal work life and then coming home and caring for those parents and then finding time to still make time for spouse or children or anything else. Lean on people. Don't try to be a hero if you're a caregiver. Um, a lot of these military people, at least for, again, I'll speak for my father, he went through a lot of pain at the end mentally and anguish. And so often I would come home and find him with his hands in his head, praying silently by himself, often asking God for forgiveness or saying, Mary, Jesus, God, please forgive me. I didn't mean to, to kill those boys. They were just on the other side. They had nothing to do with, they weren't any better or different than me. Please forgive me. And this tortured him, I think, the last few years before the dementia came in. I think we have to have massive com compassion as caregivers. And I think of many times where I fell down in that role and I was short and quick just to feed him or quick just to clean him or, and to move on back into my life. And his humanity was being lost by all of that. And I think as a caregiver, we have to remember that these people had lives long before we were here. And they, they deserve our attention. They deserve our extra time. Mm -hmm. And they deserve to be more than the sum of all their illnesses. They, are, they have lives. And we should be working hard to maintain that dignity. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard. So find a friend, a spouse, 
a clergy person. Find a place for your own respite so that you can come back refreshed to care for the, for the people on this journey because it's a long journey. And know enough to ask for help. People do want to help. Mm -hmm. We always think we have to do it all ourselves. It's okay sometimes just to say, I, I've, I can't do it alone anymore. I need help. It was hard for me to even turn to the VA. I remember bringing him to the VA here. I had felt that I had failed him. Um, my wife had heard me speak this many times. I failed my father. I was hoping that he would be in my home until he passed. And I felt, and that took a lot of time um, to even get into a position of clarity. Um, I had taken him as far as I could on the journey. And I was very lucky to have the VA here to give the amazing care that they did and kept his dignity alive to the very end. And true word to never spoke, and thank you for sharing that. And before we wrap up this interview, is there anything further you'd like to say about your father and his military service and him as a person? <clears throat> you know, I, I think I think about being a, a, a teenager sometimes when I think of my father and how often as a teenager you're running in and out of the house with little time to hear a parent. And I would, now I can close my eyes and I can see my father sitting on the couch reading some military book, some account of World War II. And I remember being a teenager kind of being, you know, snotty going, what are you wasting your time reading that? That's, that's over. That's so long ago to myself. And it's amazing. It is time. It's, it's maturity and realizing that these men and women did amazing things and went through enormous horror and we're expected to come back and pick up life uh, like it's just turning a light switch on. I think we have to have extra care for, the, for all of our military, all of the present military. We should be looking for opportunities to give them jobs and support in the public sector as much as possible. The private sector, we should be, we should be trying to make things available to help them feel, feel connected to the society that they were out there fighting for. We sleep at night because these men and women are out there willing to protect us. And I didn't get that as a teenager. I didn't get that as a young adult. I got it as a, an older adult, a middle-aged man, watching my father slowly fade away by, by dementia. But I saw, I saw the soldier, and I saw the whole man. And I'm proud of my father. Where I wasn't feeling that pride as a young man, all I could see is all the things that he would do to bother me or uh, hamper my, in, uh, my entertainment or my excitement or what I, my dreams. I saw the negative things that he would say from maybe from a generation that maybe had different thoughts. And I compartmentalized him into this little place where I said, well, I don't need to think about that. Well, I was wrong. Um, I'm very proud of my father, Mario Aiello. I'm proud to be his son and I'm very, I feel very lucky to be here today with this opportunity to share this. Mm -hmm. So my dad, three months after your passing almost, I love you and I miss you, and I hope I can honor you all the days of my life. Stephen F. Duggan, on behalf of Mario Aiello, we thank you so much for taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you all.